biodiversity, characterization and inventorying. So how does these two terms differ? And we have seen that the biodiversity is very important uh, in the planet Earth. You know, the sum total of the complete diversity of the living beings, right? And these are not chaotic. These are not simple, uh, you know, some random creatures. But these are all interrelated by the, the tree of life. Isn't it? So how do you characterize this uh, biodiversity and how do you make the list of the species uh, we already know? So that is called inventorying. So the, the difference here is that biodiversity characterization is, uh, uh, you know, it's a window to the unknown, right? You have no clue like is it a new species or an old species, right? So it might be new species. You're describing a new species altogether new to the science. So that all those things are part of the characterization but inventorying usually is about the old species you know you're you're going to make the list for example list of uh, uh, you know list of list of mosses from himalayas you know so you're making this kind of a checklist usually botanical survey of india they produce a lot of checklists you know bsi zsi also makes a lot of checklists on the animals right animal species or insect species from various places of in india right so zsi is a very old organization right like bsi so that is called inventorying while characterization is a new describing new species right so characterization means characterization of the species composition that is the alpha taxonomy or alpha biodiversity you know the species level uh, changes of the taxonomy right or the constituents of the biodiversity so world's non-biodiversity is around 2 million named species which is more than 90 percentage remains to be characterized so that is uh, the idea so well 2 million is uh, you know for uh, yes yeah, so named species and also only the eukaryotes right if you include the prokaryote it becomes a lot 10 million isn't it and taxonomic impediment is a term that means that there is a severe shortage of the qualified taxonomist and grants for taxonomy is kind of uh, you know old discipline and uh, not really in favor these days people think that okay taxonomy doesn't have much scope you know molecular biology or genomics or you know all those trendy fields like transcriptomics you know is much better taxonomy is not that very interesting that is the common misconception you see and that is the reason why the funds are limited in taxonomy and even qualified taxonomists are very less. Qualified taxonomists means just by looking at the morphology, they can identify which species is that. You know, they have the trained eye and trained, uh, you know, the ideas on how to identify the species. So this impediment means there is a severe shortage of the qualified taxonomists in the world. And the trend is actually getting better. Things are getting a little bit better with the advent of the molecular systematics there is a, again there is a uh, you know there is a there is actually a lot of people working on the taxonomy these days but not much actually if you look at the molecular biology of plants or animals or even bacteria there are so many people working on the applied aspects rather than the traditional uh, aspect although the taxonomy is no more a traditional field right of course it's a traditional but we have modern methods to uh, uh, substantiate our species descriptions right and grants also and there are so many other biases like non-tropics versus tropics so the tropics like here in india is very rich biodiversity wise if you go abroad like especially in the rich countries you know in the northern hemisphere or even southern hemisphere to rich countries like new zealand or australia or uh, you know western europe or america canada japan very rich country are usually not that diverse you know you will see that uh, uh, yes sir uh, you know so near the it's like temperate right or polar isn't it so subpolar and polar diversity canada is much of uh, canada is polar so as the scandinavia super rich but they don't really have much of the diversity same thing you see everywhere classic example is germany if you go to a german park Usually it's the same thing. You don't see much of the difference. But here in India, it's highly biodiverse. It's very rich in biodiversity. But at the same time, tropics are resource poor. You know, we don't have much money to spend on taxonomy characterization, except very few countries like maybe Singapore is a sole exception, which is actually a tropical country, but super rich. 
but Singapore, you know, it's a very small country, you know, it's only a city state, isn't it? It's a small city, that's it. The country is just a, a city. Other than Singapore, <clears throat> you know, the tropics are very, very poor. Most of the tropics around the world. So don't have much money on it. So that is why there is a latitudinal bias. Most of the non-tropical biodiversity, like temperate and polar, are already characterized because those countries are really rich, while tropics remains to be characterized, you know. So by the way, that was one of my main reasons why I have to I, I took a decision to come back even after a foreign degree. You know, I didn't go for uh, I didn't even try to settle abroad to go for a postdoc and settle. Many of my friends did it. You know, they settled in uh, rich countries. And I stayed back home here in India because I know that because my discipline is taxonomy, there are a lot of hidden gems to explore in India. You know, so people are very less who are actually taxonomists applying molecular systematics tool and here in India, you know. So a lot of things. So that is the reason. Well, my decision really did pay lot of dividends because I did discover many new species you know another bias is on habitat most of the people are working on terrestrial habitat be it in mountain or on a arid zone you know or tropical rainforest but how many of uh, the taxonomists are working on marine field although the marine diversity is very profound and there is a saying that you know we know a lot more about moon rather than our own ocean even ocean exploration not many people are working on it right how many of the countries have got submersibles you know submarine research submarines very few countries less than 10 countries have it like the america have got alvin and the japanese have a very famous research submarine which they dived very near to the indian ocean very near to india but unfortunately we missed out the opportunity to dive over there because we don't have submarine so what is the fun of diving there you will potentially discover a lot of new species unknown to the uh, uh, science and it can have a lot of applications too you know so you will miss out all those opportunities if you don't actually explore the marine habitats you know or well, just think of it how many of the universities in india the botany department have people working on marine system like marine algae very few, isn't it? Most of the botanists, not just here in India, but everywhere in the world, you know. So departments are highly focused on terrestrial, but less focused on the marine. That is a habitat bias, you know. And why it is focused on terrestrial habitats? Again, confirmation bias. Human beings, so at present, we are a terrestrial animal. And for us, the terrestrial diversity is all what we know. But again, it's spurious. You know, so the real diversity is in uh, marine as well, you know, and also, of course, the life originated on the ocean, isn't it? It's the cradle of the uh, origin of life. So it is really important to know about the marine diversity as well. And oceans cover much of the Earth's surface, almost 72 percentage, you know. And uh, there is also bias at the taxa level to lineage bias. For example, certain taxa like flowering plants are very well characterized, you know. How about uh, some other taxa, uh, you know, like for example, golden brown algae, very, very few people are working on it, you know. So right now, golden brown algae is very, very less, but that doesn't mean that in reality, this golden brown algae taxa are less. It's just because people are not working on those, uh, pra you know, prasinophytes, for example, very less people are working on those slimes and that is the reason why. Uh, you know, these lineages are comparatively less explored. So, lineage bias, you know. Now, characterization and inventorying, these two terms are different. Characterization refers documentation of the taxonomic information that lead to changes in the classification. That means species discovery, you are describing a new species along with its naming, the nomenclature, right? And discovery of cryptic species, that means the discovery that one species is a complex of multiple species. Earlier known one species is actually different different species. One example would be giraffe. Early on, like few years, five years back, the giraffe is considered to be just one species. Now we know that there are at least seven species inside giraffe, cryptic species, you know. And species split, species lump, all these are part of the characterization. What is split and lump? Like hair splitting, right? One 
splitting into two, isn't it? That is what the cryptic species is all about. So splits and lumps are taxonomic corrections that alter the circumscription of the scientific name without altering the name itself. The name is same, but how, what construes that name, the circumscription of that name is different. So division of the earlier species, the putative species into multiple species is called split, which usually occurs through the raising of subspecies to the full species, you know, cryptic species gets split into individual species when found, like in the case of giraffe, you know, so that is called split. Now, union of putative species into a single species is called lumps or also called synonymy, right? So these two species are synonymous. One classic example from algae is enteromorpha and ulva, you know, so tubular forms of ulva used to be called enteromorpha. The genus, these two genus have been lumped together because of the molecular evidence. And now it, the, the lumped genus is called Ulva based on the principle of priority because the name Ulva is a lot more, uh, you know, older than the name uh, Enteromorpha. That is, uh, you know, Ulva is a Linnaean name uh, resurrected by, introduced by or described by Linnaeus, called Linnaeus, right? And inventorying, the term inventorying means biodiversity documentation of overall species diversity of a particular area. So that is about using the checklists, isn't it? So you are you're, you are describing what is the non-species diversity, it's nothing new and no alteration of the taxonomy, right? So inventorying is kind of more simpler stuff while characterization is more advanced, it touches the core of the taxonomy, right? So it generates a list of the non-species present at the location. No new taxonomically relevant information such as species discovery, cryptic species discovery or synonymy is generated. However, inventory can generate new records. So that means a new to that area. You know, it is previously described species, but new to that particular location. Right? So identification of species new to location that has never been reported. For example, the species which is already uh, Sargasm Zangii, one of our paper. It is a Chinese species described elsewhere, but we are the first person who described this species from India. So it is called, uh, you know, species record, new records of the existing species. That is part of the inventory, right? So biodiversity inventories generate the so called checklists, simple list of the species in a given location. So that is the difference between the term inventorying and characterization is all about. One of the examples of the inventorying is all taxa biodiversity inventory, which is very, very tricky to generate. Documentation of each and every species in the given location, including animals, plants, eukaryote, microbes, prokaryote, virus, prions. Uh, this is not that easy, right? Especially virus, you know, if you go really bottom, it's very difficult. Like, you know, uh, one gram of the marine ocean do contains more than a million viruses. So how do you characterize everything? It's impossible, isn't it? So no species exist in nature independently. That is the idea why the ATBI is getting popular. If you just look at one like angiosperms of uh, Himalaya and you make a list of it, it's kind of useless. Because you should know like what what this what are other organisms, like a tree species, you know, or a gymnosperm, uh, you know, tree species, angio or gymno, right? What are the other uh, organisms that grows, like what are the bird species that grows, at, you know, that are living on the tree? So if you know different kinds of species in one location, that gives you a more holistic picture and that gives you an overall view, the zoomed out perspective. And that is the idea of this ATBI, you know. And generation of ATBI is a daunting task and it's always incomplete because uh, bacterial, viral and prion diversity, you know, so prion is just you know, replicating protein without gene, uh, you know, without nucleic acids, right? And yeah, it's impossible. But still, we can go for this ATBI of at least all eukaryotes in one location. Why not? You know, species checklist is a very simpler approach targeting one specific taxa, like checklist of mosses in India. But look, organisms do not exist alone in the nature. It's always living in association with other organisms, right? So inevitably lives as part of complex ecological niche. So overall information is missed out. So that's why these checklists 
are hardly informative right so to generate the checklist trained taxonomists should first identify the species so species identification is very important and to identify the species you can look the dichotomous identification key which is a formal approach and informal rather getting popular approaches from photographs reverse image search and also there are so many uh, you know uh, tax identifying apps like plan net plan snap picture this you know and also for zoology like frog finder app very common i love that app a lot bird finder or and also the for butterflies there are apps available nowadays and now finally dna barcodes are uh, yeah, it is kind of expensive. Earlier it used to be very expensive, but nowadays it's not that very expensive, but still it is expensive. Come, you know, you pay nothing for uh, the apps, right? But for DNA sequencing, you have to pay something for sequencing, right? Uh, but it's much more reliable, even uh, re re reliable than uh, looking at, you know, this kind of like apps based thing. It's much more reliable, the DNA barcode, but it can only identify the non species, right? And AI is now coming in picture. AI is uh, uh, significantly changing the way that how we classify the taxa in uh, herbaria, you know, herbarial voucher. How this is a classic herbarium. So how how do we classify this herbarial voucher? This is, uh, you know, the AI is completely transforming. And also AI is transforming the, how the plant identifying plant or other animal or frog, butterfly, identifying algorithms work, you know. And DNA barcode in the issue, you know, one of the major issue, the roadblock had been cost, but nowadays it's significantly cheaper. And it's not, of course, it's not practical for the field biologist. If you are on the field, how can you, uh, you know, how can you uh, sequence it, right? So generating sequences, well, again, there are new technology that can change the way that we uh, sequence, we are process sequencing, for example, nanopore, you know, so it's like a match, matchstick. Uh, sequencing machine that you can take into your uh, field probably in next uh, one decade that technology become much more affordable and many accessions that the barcodes are wrongly identified in the you know in the uh, database so you're comparing your sequence with what is in the database if if the database itself is wrong then your barcode is no more reliable isn't it and many tropical species have never been barcoded so that bias is very prominent you know so there is nothing to compare against if you are barcoding a pro the tropical uh, species like here in india so the nearest match is mostly from the europe or japan so you know you are left with nothing to compare to isn't it so there is going to be a, another major issue this is one of our pa old paper about um, uh, the prevalent of uh, misidentified uh, you know, a species, especially brown barcoded as red, but reality is green. So it's actually a green, uh, you know, the endophytic algae and it gets amplified. And then, uh, you know, the nearest match, match in the, uh, sequ the sequence repository is a red algae, you know. So, but actually it's a brown algae, but it's green endophyte that got amplified. So all those uh, confusions are you know, uh, you have to be worried about in the database, right? Many of the spe species are misidentified in the database because anybody can submit the sequence to the NCBI, you know? So current standard of species identification includes a combined approach, the so-called poly, uh, you know, uh, polymorphic approach, isn't it? So you are actually ap applying many, uh, you know, many uh, evidences from multiple sources, right? So morphology, life history, ecology, ultrastructure, biochemistry, all these can inform the decision on your uh, uh, species identifying. So of course, DNA barcoding alone is not sufficient. You need multiple evidences. Ultrastructure, for example, the, the ultrastructure of the flagella, you know, so what, what, what kind of ultrastructure the base of flagella has got or chloroplast, all these things will help you for better identifying the species, you know. <coughs> yes, so the specimen vouchers are also a very important part of the taxonomy, right. So vouchers means you're collecting and you're preserving the sample. So preserved sample is called voucher, which are permanent records of the collected specimen accessible in any public repository 
for example in the museum or herbaria or you know free storage you know so that is called voucher so usually it is herbarium pressed voucher you know pressed plant material on the herbarium sheet and it is indispensable part of the taxonomic study and wider biodiversity documentation so unless you have this voucher the taxonomic paper makes no sense so if you are writing any paper you need to mention the voucher number this is the uh, uh, you know the herbarium sheet in which our entire uh, you know work is based upon so without that it makes no sense you know so how do you make the voucher so do check out uh, a more detailed instruction on how to make this uh, voucher specimen it is available in the course website you can download it and also the standard format that we follow here in this central university of herbarium uh, central university of punjab herbarium that is cupb uh, you know plants of punjab or whatever it is so it is so uh, who is the determined right this is the uh, the binomial name and from where it is isolated from an exact location lat long and what is the habitat looks like the ecology what other species is growing in the proximity of that plant species what was the height and uh, the fruits and flowers and flower frequency everything you can write in that identifying you know all these are highly informative for the the people who are referring your collection right and who collected and when did you collect who else did you join with that same collection everything matters and also you can write uh, you know the dna sequence number in the gen bank sequence identifier you know another important record of this taxonomy is uh, distribution maps essential component of species inventory so distribution maps are overlay of the species ranges in the geographical map like the google map the kml file you can download as a description of that particular species you know so it points to exact location where you can find this species you know and it's very very important and uh, many of such maps can be downloadable at the global biodiversity information facility gbif you can go to this site you can download the kml file and you can use it as an overlay to the existing google maps this is one of the floristic map which we generated uh, of my antarctic trip uh, all the the locations in antarctica where i sampled this is from the larsman hills and you know for example like this manning island this location if you zoom in the exact location where i collected the lichens you can see and if you go this esther island all these are the locations where i collected seaweeds so future explorers can go to the same location to collect the same species if you are interested in and another reason is that this is a snapshot of the biodiversity when I visited in 2016-17 mission. And after 10 years or 20 years, you will see that the, how, how does that floristic map changes. Maybe it gets greenified, right? Be, uh, because of the global warming, more species are getting introduced there. All these things uh, you can actually make use of this floristic map. So that is why it is indispensable part of taxonomy or biodiversity documentation these floristic maps now species discovery means you are discovering a new species so description should comply with various codes of the taxonomy like icn for the plants and iczn or icnp ICT. it all depends on what you are identifying describing as a new species you know so description should be in latin or in english so in one sense these courts resemble the discipline of law you know so we have already introduced icn right so the case studies matter for example uh, the priority we already uh, uh, said about the priority so whichever is the earlier taxon if you are uh, you know lumping these two taxa into a new species whichever is the older one will have the priority older names have the priority because this one is older x the news uh, you know after lumping it will also have x not y because y is described in 1911 while x is in 1857 like that effective publication which i already told you about so you need to uh, you know you need to publish that in a journal or in a book thesis is not accepted as an effective publication you know and unlike patenting the taxonomy should ascertain that the new species is indeed a new one it's just like the patenting but unlike patenting there is no money involved you know you have to prove that it is a unique species 
and biological species cannot be patented because you know you cannot take right on the already existing species on the nature you know so people cannot make money out of it but yeah it's a credit uh, which is equivalent to the patenting credit it's much bigger credit you know uh, dis discovery of new species right and well no consensus exists which morphological features should be prioritized so whether one unique feature could be sufficient to call it as a unique species all these are the uh, you know uh, it depends on the lineage where you are working on uh, for example life history form sexual and asexual or two morphological forms like branched or unbranched among marine algae can you rely on these uh, forms to call it as a new species it might not be it might be simply in response to changing environment you know and that is the reason why traditional uh, taxonomy is different from modern systematics because we don't rely much on the morphological features you know the only solution is dna taxonomy you need to actually rely on the uh, sequences isn't it? so your use of dna sequence data for taxonomic or biodiversity characterization is called dna taxonomy especially for the species discovery and uh, delineation delineation means how it differs from closely related species you know so in contrast to the dna barcoding which means that identification of previously described species using public database that is called barcoding barcoding is only for already non species you can see it it's it's a form of species identification while taxonomy is for describing a new species that's the discovery of the species right so both relies on the sequence data at the standard barcodes and generated barcode data will be searched against the standard bar database first to see whether the newly generated sequences matches with any existing accession that sequences in the database and if it's already existing then it's of course it's invalid it's not a new species right and if it's nothing is existing in the species the, in the database then what are the chances two possible reason one is that species in question is previously described but nobody generated the dna barcode because older time dna barcoding was not that common so older taxonomy is already described but somehow they didn't generate the dna sequence you know but second option is that species is truly new and previously undescribed so you can never rule out the first option you know it's already described but they didn't generate the dna sequence data so to rule out the first point you need to list out all the accepted species of a particular genus and you need to fill the gap so wherever the uh, gene sequence of a particular locus is missing so all those missing link you need to generate and then you need to uh, you know you need to match your species with those uh, link and even after that stop there is no significant match then you can say that it's a new species and what is significant match by the way uh, so there is a again there is nothing like accepted percentage identity but usually it is around 98 percentage so if it's uh, you know uh, if it is uh, let, let us say if it's 98 percentage is the match would you call it as a new species so there is no consensus but yeah 98.7 used to be the the cutting off point these days so if this if the nearest match of the generated dna is less than or equal to 98.7 percentage then this match might be a new species you know so if the nearest match is 98.8 then you can not call it as a new species but if it's 98.7 or 6 or 98 or 97 then yeah you can call it as a new species providing you meet the criterion which i described earlier you know so this cutoff is lower for prokaryote if, if you're working with the DNA, uh, the, the uh, bacteria then it's typically 95 percentage so uh, in as for the bacterial taxonomy the enter primates which typically have higher than 98 percent se sequence homology in common should be called as one species so it is quite rigorous you know the the bacterial taxonomy you can you can say it is highly rigorous because uh, dna based sequencing is uh, you know used at one point only for the, the bacteria right then slowly start applying the same logic for eukaryotes too so if you are a bacteriologist then you know the primates will be considered as the one species which is which is incorrect isn't it yeah 
And now we have another species concept called phylogenetic concept and multiple sequence alignment is constructed from the nearest database matches and phylogenetic tree is reconstructed from the alignment. That is how we are using this species concept. You know, so nearest match after blasts, so, uh, you know, search, homology search and you are constructing the tree and then you are looking is it actually a one species or multiple species, right? So new species accession should form the monophyletic group in the tree. Then you can call it as a new species. So monophyly means a group of organisms that forms a clade, a common ancestor and all its descendants. Right. So that clade is very important remark of this phylogenetic species concept. So these groups are based on synapomorphic characters that is shared derived characters or evolutionary innovations. You know. So only clades are named in phylogenetic species concept. So monophyly means, yeah, this one is a monophyletic group, the aves. But non-avian dinosaurs are paraphyletic group because you are excluding aves from it. Right? If you are including aves, including crocodile, then all together it is a monophyletic group. And dinosaurs and aves together is also a monophyletic group, no problem. But if you're cutting off and then defining something which is paraphyletic. Another example is uh, dinosauria, right? This is also a paraphyletic group. So the whole thing is reptile is monophyles, right? If you are including the birds and dinosaur also into the reptile, it is monophyletic. But that is not how the traditional zoologists refer reptilia, isn't it? That is why it is reptilia is a paraphyletic group. So reciprocal monophyly is the gold standard criterion for phylogenetic species concept. What is that? Uh, it is basically two groups are completely separated into two distinct clades. For example, none of this clade members are present in this clade and none of this clade is present in this clade. Right? This is red group and this is blue group. This is, you know, green while this one is basically brown. There is a pink also here, right? So, yeah, this one is classic example of the reciprocal monophyly. So, it is completely resolved. You can call that this tree is a resolved tree. Resolved means completely separating. All the species are very clear. There is no confusion, right? And if you are saying that your all new species accessions form one clade and none of the new species accessions cluster within previously non-species and none of the previously non-species clusters within your new species clade then you can call this clade as a new species as per phylogenetic species concept i hope it's clear you know so in summary it's estimated that more than 90 percentage of species on planet earth remains to be discovered and therefore taxonomy based biodiversity characterization is extremely important and there are several biases at Play and also impediment, taxonomic impediment, right? Uh, the trained taxonomists are very low and also the grants for taxonomy is also getting very less. Biases include the habitat bias and lineage bias, right? And species inventorying versus characterization, these two terms are different, right? Usually inventorying is for the checklists and uh, the, the newer and faster methods for species identification involves Algorithm based reverse image checkup, you know, it's AI is also very, very interesting for that. And also for by DNA barcoding, right? Quite reliable. And for species characterization, especially taxonomists need to extensively follow and adhere with the standard codes of nomenclature, uh, you know, like ICN. So the codes are really important for uh, DNA characterization, I mean, species characterization. Species discovery and description, you know, it's it's about the new species, you know, you're describing a new species, right? Uh, so it's a polyphasic approach. Many evidence from many fields are you are actually accumulating for describing a new species. Not just the DNA, but also morphology and also biochemistry and habitat, life history. Everything is in informative for describing a new species. You know, that is a current gold standard, the polyphasic approach. And the final phylogram, reciprocal monophyly, is basically the gold standard for phylogenetic species concept. Means none of the newly 
described species, suspected new species are part of the other clades and vice versa. You know, 